This episode of Behind the Video is brought to you by the Independent Media Network. The Independent Media Network helps journalists and content creators create their own jobs by building sustainable online businesses. If you're an unemployed or underemployed journalist or content creator, visit imnct.com for more information. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Behind the Video. This is episode number 66. We are moving into retirement territory, not quite. Uh, joining me as always is my lovely and talented co-host from the other coast, Tim Street. Tim, from Los Angeles, how's it going? It is going well. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited with it, with our guest today. We have two guests on the show. One, one of them's kind of not really a guest. One of them's uh, staff, right? Well, yeah, yeah, one of them's our producer, Jason. Hi, everybody. Jason, how's it going? Where, where, are, you, um, where are you Google hanging out today? I am just I'm just outside of Toronto, Canada. And um, do you, do you commute into the city? Do you work out of your no, house? I, I work out of my house. Uh, I do uh, web design and uh, mostly WordPress. So, and then do uh, podcasts on the side. Very cool. And and our other guest, uh, big Disney aficionado, Lou Mangello. Lou, is aficionado you... another word for nerd? Disney aficionado, yes. nerd. It's okay. <laughs> Yes, and, and are you coming to us from Orlando? I am. I am uh, coming to you as the crow flies about a mile behind the Magic Kingdom. So, A mile behind that? In, in my thinking, a mi- like a mile north of mile the Magic north. Kingdom? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's like Orange Grove territory in my mind. Yeah. Or at <laughs> it least was. It not, used not so to much. be. Yeah, not so much yeah. anymore. Wow. So, Lou, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you've been doing here. Um, so I, I met Lou through Tim at New Media Expo this year. We were at a, at a party on, high up on, in the Rio, and uh, Lou was telling me how he was a lawyer and doing, doing the law thing and had a love of Disney World. And before you know it, he's got a podcast. He takes the family, moves them to Orlando, and uh, he's made a business out of it. So, so Lou, what's the secret here? I mean, you've, you found something really focused, right? And, and you've, you've made it work. So tell, tell us about, just tell us your story. How did you get started in this? Yeah, so the, the secret is to do as I say, not as I do, because this was never sort of the, uh, the game plan originally. I, um, I had always wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I, I say that Al Pacino lied to me because I thought it was going to be like Injustice for All and L.A. Law, and it wasn't really like that at all. But I, I, um, I practiced law for about 10 years and, and enjoyed what I was doing. I had a, uh, an IT consulting company on the side, and always having been in the service business, I, I said, you know, I want to make something once and resell it. I watched too many infomercials, I guess. So the idea of a book came to be, and I sort of wrote the book that I wanted to read, which is about Walt Disney World. I, I had a love of Disney since uh, I was three. I uh, was going with my family every year. So I bo- wrote the book I wanted to read. I wanted to see if I could just sort of challenge myself to write it and get it published. found a publisher. Uh, started my little two-page you know, brochure website back in 2004, and I kind of grew from there, you know, articles, which were blog posts back then, and a community. Uh, and it was starting the community that sort of made me realize that I was not the only dork sitting in my basement back in New Jersey that loved Disney as much <laughs> as I did. Um, fast forward to 2005, I saw podcasting coming down the pike. I realized that the, powerful, the, the power of the medium, you know, spoken word being so much, um, you could do so much more with it and convey the passion more than you could anything that you could write. Uh, spent a lot of time explaining to people back in 2005 what a podcast was um, and how they could actually find it. And, um, you know, fast forward a few years, it sort of accidentally grew into a business. I never really set out for it to be a business. I was commuting basically back and forth from New Jersey to Florida to do research and work on projects. And uh, at one point, I took the leap of faith. Um, I sold the house. I thought I was going to live in forever. I left my job. Uh, my wife left her job, and we packed up the Honda Odyssey and, uh, and drove down to Florida and uh, been down here for about the past four years. And, and yep. basically, I talk about Disney World full-time for a living. That's great. And the kids must have not had any problem with that move whatsoever, right? Yeah. Who's, you know, well, at least for like a week, you're the best dad in the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> does, does Disney World get old, old to them now that, that you're probably there, you know, a couple, couple times a month? Yeah, it's not because I specifically don't do that. Right? I don't, um, we don't go every week. We don't go, you know, all the time because I still, I don't want to be like, oh, I'm going to freaking Disney World again. So it still is fresh and it's new and it's exciting when I take them to the parks. 
and you know, this is a very highly focused podcast. I mean, it's not even Disneyland; it is strictly Disney World. What's your demographic? Are, are, are is, it, is it parents of children? Is it is it young kids? Like, what, who who's listening to your show, and, and how has that impacted sponsorships? It uh, it really is primarily Disney. You know, the, the show is WDW, like Walt Disney World Radio. But I do talk about you know, I've sort of expanded because I do go out to Disneyland. We do uh, group cruises every year. We go out to Hawaii again. A lot better than being a lawyer, um, <laughs> and I, you know, when you start a show, you don't you don't know who it's going to resonate with. And what I found over time, which I thought was very interesting, was that I have parents who listen, I have single solo travelers who listen, grandma, grandpa, and I have kids. I'm surprised how many young kids, you know, nine, ten, eleven years old, who, with their parents' permission, email me or come up to me at a meet or an event because they listen. Uh, I had a bus driver email me. He said, "You know, I play your show in the bus on the way to school, and the kids love it. And, and I, my show is 100% family friendly, um, completely in the spirit of Disney G rated. So it's nice to know that is it is accessible to younger kids, and it's you know because they want to be connected to the experience as well too." That's it, and and it seems like it's working working pretty well there. And what, what how, how do you sell sponsorships, and what's your primary vehicle for for revenue? It, it, it's not just advertising, right? I mean, you're doing other things as well. Yeah, and again, this is sort of how the business happened accidentally when I got that first phone call from a potential sponsor who said, oh, hey, listen, I, I love what you're doing. I'd love to sponsor your show. What do you charge? I went, oh, <clears throat> well, you know, let me get back to you and put together a proposal. I hung out my hung out, I'm like, now what the hell do I do? Yeah, right. Because <laughs> I, you know, I wasn't prepared for it. Um, so, yeah, uh, sponsorships is uh, primarily uh, my, my primary revenue stream. Uh, I am very, very selective into who I partner with because I believe really in sort of create, creating relationships with partners as opposed to just taking you know banner ads or whatever it is uh, I heavily vet my partners and I look for obviously very organic relationships that bring value to my audience um, and I take a very limited number so as not to dilute my message or their message as well too so that's where the primary revenue for the show comes from I also have a number of products I've written two books I have uh, apps I've got a number of uh, audio walking tours that I sell on CD and instant download and, you know, again, accidental businesses that come from it as sort of a tertiary business, I've started doing a lot of um, public speaking in terms of motivational stuff or stuff about Disney. I've done tours of the parks and things like that. So uh, you never sort of realize the um, ancillary businesses that can come from it. See, it seems to me, let me, let me jump in here for a second, sure. but it seems to me with, with the sponsorship um, angle on this that you're highly targeted. That, that there would be a lot of folks out there that want to reach the people that are listening to your show. Anybody that, that has um, a product, a service uh, for people headed to Walt Disney World or has something uh, to market to them while they're at Walt Disney right. World, that seems incredibly targeted. Absolutely. You know, my audience does one thing. Uh, they go to Disney. That's where they spend their time. That's where they spend their money. If I started talking about other theme parks or Wiki Wachi, they would tune out, right, because this is what they care about. So you're right. From a sponsor's perspective, uh, I do give them exactly who they're looking for, a very loyal, very targeted, engaged audience that I think I've built a relationship of trust with, and I think that carries a lot of value because um, they know that anybody that I present to them via sponsorships or, or anything that I talk about is somebody that I use and somebody that I trust and obviously very, like I said, organic to who they are and what they're doing. If I advertised, you know, Drobo or a hosting company, it wouldn't make any sense for them. No, but I would imagine anybody that like advertises in Orlando Magazine or right. the Sentinel, um, for the most part, th those people are trying to target people interested in Walt Disney World, and th that's that's your audience, plain Absolutely. and simple. Whereas 100%. if they're in Orlando Magazine, they may be overspraying a little bit. Absolutely, yeah, um, very much so. I think it's important to point out, too, that you're separate from the Disney brand. So you're yes. reporting on things that are happening at Disney. What's the relationship like with, with Walt Disney World? I would imagine this is helpful for their marketing efforts to some degree, right? Yeah, I, I am independent, which gives me the freedom and flexibility to talk about what I want to, when I want to, without being sort of directed. Uh, but I have a great relationship with the company, which I, I am uh, very grateful for. I think I sort of built up a... Uh, uh, a level of trust and credibility with them over the years. And I think you're right. I think that companies and brands like Disney realize the value of what we as third-party content providers can produce. You know, if they say, hey, come eat at Pecos Bills, it's awesome, 
it's a marketing message. If I do a live restaurant review and I'm like, oh my god, this is the best freaking hamburger in the world, it carries a much different you know weight and message to it. So you, you um, know they're, they're that, great to that's work where with. I started. I, I started at at the time Pecos Bills was connected <laughs> to the Mile Long Bar, and when I was 16, I was pouring Pepsi. This is before Coke <laughs> at the Mile Long Bar. And then uh, delivering burgers and fries at uh, Pecos Bills. That was my first gig. I've come I a go, long way, baby. <laughs> I, I could go for a burger right now. So. Hey, uh, so, uh, oh, go I, I got to jump in here, Lou. I, I'm curious with with the stuff that you're you're doing. You know, the relationship that you have with with Disney. Do you know anything coming up? Any secrets that you you might be able to tease or share with us this morning? Um. You know, I'm I'm not that guy, right? I'm not the guy who, because I'm very fortunate that I know enough people in the company that um, uh, talk about stuff that they're working on, and I respect and appreciate that that trust and confidentiality. I, I will speculate, right? I'll I'll speculate. So we've heard about Avatar Land uh, coming to Disney's Animal Kingdom. We've heard rumors that it's not coming. I know that that plane is in flight. Avatar Land is, is under construction, and I, for one, am excited for what that possibility is going to bring. This idea of not a ride based on the movie, but this world of Pandora and this land that's going to be have these bioluminescent lights at night, I think could be beautiful and a great relationship I think with James Cameron is akin to one that they had had with Lucas before they went out and bought it. Um, I would not be surprised, and this is not a far stretch to say that we will see more Star Wars coming to Walt Disney World. I would expect that Disney's Hollywood Studios is a natural fit for that. Uh, it just makes perfect sense, and there's certainly, as you know, a lot of room uh, in there by Indiana Jones and back by Muppets that I think they could make a Star Wars land and I will forever endeavor to try and get them to build just a little kiosk called Admiral Snack Bar just so they could say <laughs> it's a snack. <laughs> it's a trap. Hey, I'll tell it's you what, if they, if, they, if they build that Star Wars park, I'm, I'm moving down to Orlando too yeah. and, and I'll, I'll, be your, I'll be your roving uh, <laughs> reporter. I'll be dressed up as Yoda or something and it's uh, <laughs> great. Hey, we got a question in the chat room from, uh, by the way, you've brought in like a lot of people today. So we've got a lot of people awesome. watching. Um, so you have people hanging on every word. They want to know that you got, you got some, you got some uh, more secrets, let them rip. Uh, but Jim, Jim Lawler said, uh, Lou, I love your work. Uh, what type of law uh, were you practicing and what was the main reason for making the switch? And you touched on a little bit of that, but uh, what were you doing law I chased ambulances, pretty much. Okay. No, I can't, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a, a general litigation practice, so it was great because I got to do a little bit of everything. Somebody might come to you for a real estate transaction and they could come back for workers' compensation. I would do bankruptcy. I would do municipal court and federal court. So it was something different uh, every day. And at the time, I also had a, a side business because obviously I don't like sleeping very much. Uh, I had a small business IT consulting company. Uh, really, as companies were starting to network and build websites, I wanted to be their one sort of point of contact. And as I was juggling these real two full-time careers, something had to give. Uh, I was in practice with my dad, who was very supportive of my, of my business. He said, look, go do it. You can come back if you need to at half salary. I'll, I'll take you back. So uh, <laughs> I, I left. <laughs> I did the IT thing for a while, and then I was actually a uh, the chief technology officer at a, a medical imaging company before I left that job to move to Florida. Wow. So you've, you've yeah, been, I was I was waiting to hear. Um, yeah, I, I sued Walt Disney World for people that slipped <laughs> on um, frozen bananas. <laughs> and this was the compromise that we reached in. Uh, and getting there, and, and you're media savvy. I mean, did you did you always have an aptitude for for doing radio and video, or was it something you had to had to learn? Uh, I, I very much learned on the fly. Um, I always enjoyed. You know, I actually started off in college. I shouldn't even admit this. I started off in college as a, as a theater major, and then I realized what the heck am I doing? So I switched over and uh, and, and went back to pursuing the law. But uh, I, I think when you talk about something, and I hate to keep using the, the the overused word, when you talk about something that, that you're passionate about, I think it becomes very easy. And when you feel like you're just having a conversation with, you know, people, to use a Jersey euphemism, like you're sitting around a diner in New Jersey just talking about Disney World, it's very easy. And what did your, what did your friends think when you told them you were doing this? You know, because we've heard of people like just moving, moving away and chasing a dream, but this right. is like, this was, this was, must have been a shock to some of them, yeah. right? They're like, what are you, a freak? What are you, like, what? Like, first of all, when, when I said I was going to do a podcast, they're like, wait a minute, you're going to sit alone in your basement and talk about Disney World for an hour a week to people that you don't know if they're listening or not? And I said, yeah, pretty much it's what I'm going to be doing. And then when I said, listen, I'm packing up the family truckster and I'm moving to Florida. I don't have a job. My wife doesn't have a job. My kids aren't in school. I'm not really sure where we're going to live yet. My parents are going to find me a house while I'm on the way down. Um, 
some were supportive, some were like, yeah, great idea. See you in a couple of weeks and you come back. Right. But um, you need to take a leap of faith, man. You have to have a leap of faith. You have to have a, you know, a parachute and a plan behind it. But um, I, I was very fortunate to have a supportive family and infrastructure behind me. So And, and now Lou has supportive fans. I don't, we didn't really mention this, but, but Lou does these meetups where listeners of his podcast will come to live events in person, and they show up in droves. I mean, I, I just happened into one one time because uh, a friend of mine was attending one, Jen Selke, and uh, her husband, Brian, uh, they, they were there in Vegas. And I, I show up, and there's like 75 people mobbing Lou. And I'm like, who, who are all those people talking to Lou? And they're like, she's like, uh, those are his fans. This is a meetup. <laughs> and I think that's what's really important to mention here, too, is that for a lot of successful independent content creators, you are a brand and a person. Right, there's the two are almost interchangeable, and and I think that you've done very well at 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 that, where you have the brand, but you also have the person, and you you know you must feel the tug to do more. And how do you do you plan to grow into other parks with other shows that are separate from WDW Radio, or, or are you going to just kind of stick to stick to what's working? Uh, right now, I, I'm sticking to what I what I do, which is primarily Walt Disney World, and and touching on the other Disney parks because I think they're all sort of interconnected and they're part of that Disney experience. Um, I know with the name WW Radio, it's sort of a misnomer because I talk about more than Walt Disney World and radio is what the I, the idea I had back in 2005. But I'm obviously doing video and in-person stuff. Um, I'm gonna kind of stick with that, but I have a lot of ideas for ways to continue to grow what I'm doing and reach more people. Um, certainly would like to expand into other mediums, uh, you know, uh, especially as the line between what is online and what's on your TV is starting to get blurred. I, I think there's an opportunity to reach people who love this product, they love this brand, and they can't really get enough of it. They're just they're hungry for content, and uh, I'm going to try and deliver to them in a, in a few other different ways. J Jason, but, you're, you're starting a podcast on SeaWorld, right? And it's... It's it's not just about the the performing of the animals, but uh, how to barbecue them. Well, I'm going to try a new format and actually do the podcast in the water with with the animals. Nice, love it. There you That'd go. That'd be great. That's great. And and you got to get some some high end equipment for the underwater uh, component there. But uh, that's fantastic. That might be a bit of research. <laughs> it might take a little bit of research there. Well, Lou, would you mind sticking around so we can talk about some news? I'd love to. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. And I'll tell you, Lou has brought more people onto this live broadcast than I've ever seen. So this is uh, this is great. Um, we should have you on every week, and, and uh, it'll help our <laughs> help our our fledgling podcast about everything that we talk about. So Tim, the the Emmys are tonight. Are you watching or going? What's 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 the uh, what's the scuttlebutt out there? Um, you know, it, it's one of those things where uh, w once you know somebody that's won an Emmy, it's it's like, it's fascinating. <laughs> our, our buddy Bernie Sue and uh, and Jay Bushman, they both walked away with uh, Emmys uh, last week. They had an Emmy show uh, for the the creative arts, uh, so different things that won't be in tonight's broadcast. But tonight's broadcast looks like it'll be fun. I'll be watching from home. I don't I don't uh, want to go brave. Uh, the crowds and, and uh, stand in the uh, uh, the, the the crowded uh, downtown area at the Nokia, but um, it, it looks like it'll be fun. Um, a lot of people are concerned about the uh, the fall TV schedule uh, taking a dip. Uh, I mean, audiences are are being lost left and right, and so the Emmys is is you know here to. Uh, Try to build viewership on new shows, and unfortunately, we have some shows that that are getting that'll probably get awards tonight that are going away. So mm. uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. And Jason, this is big for Netflix too, because I think there's there are two shows up on the uh, nominations for for Netflix. Uh, Orange is I don't know if Orange and the New Black got one, but I know uh, uh, House of Cards is certainly in 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 competition, right? Yes, that should it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the the take between. Uh, broadcast television and television in the new with Netflix and Amazon trying to bring TV shows uh, to a new generation. It's going to be interesting to see what happens tonight. This could be a very big night for uh, for online media. Probably, you know, not the kind of stuff that we do, but it's certainly. Um, I think the the, the the rising tide raises uh, raises all all boats there. And um, so this week, you know, we were looking for our tops of the week, and the YouTube charts are all out of whack again. So. Um, we're going to take a look, though, at the tube filter top 50, which really hasn't changed all that much. If you're uh, into Katy Perry, then you're, you're going to be happy to know that she is uh, topping uh, the YouTube channel charts this week. 
Um, she has a new album out, which kind of sounds like the old one, I guess. But hey, if you're into <laughs> Katy Perry, it's great. Um, Miley Cyrus is still up there. And you know, I'm glad we got Lou on because uh, Tim and I were just fascinated with this number three, which is the Disney Collector. Have you heard of this Disney Collector person? The Disney? No, I haven't. So she is the top th number three channel on, on YouTube. And uh, I'll pull it up real quick. What she does is um, basically does these reviews of Disney, ch Disney toys. Um, so it's more on the collector side than it is on the theme park side. Um, but her, you, know, you don't even see her. She just does this uh, voiceover and she demos the toy. And apparently this has become, I'm going to skip through the ad here. Um, apparently this has become a really big deal for kids who are you know, just <laughs> watching her channel to see what these toys do. And she does a really thorough review of it. It's, it's fascinating. Um, so here, here you go. She just opens the box up and kind of steps through it, and I mean, it's really pretty, Well, she, you know, she does it all in character voice, so it's like, oh, cookie, play doh <laughs> oh, very good. Uh, I would, you know, and she, does, and she did that, it would it'd probably be double the viewership, but um, it's amazing. I mean, she's got her, you know, she's definitely got her keywords down. I mean, she knows, she knows how to market this stuff, but um, this one here, this was from a few, uh, few weeks ago, um, 5.7 million views. Wow. And she's just like opening up this thing and just looking at it, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so. You know, maybe there's a, there's, a, there's a toy outlet there for you uh, to go into there. So uh, she's number three. Um, what I found interesting, though, was, uh, you know, beyond that, is Sky does Minecraft and the movie trailers and stuff. But um, something that was interesting, though, is that this week, according to um, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and you can actually see this uh, channel up on, uh, on YouTube, uh, George Takai was hired by AARP to do, like, a little web series. And it's got nothing to do with AARP, but they... You know, it was interesting. They found a senior citizen who's very popular among young people to do a video. And Tim, have you have you followed this at all? I mean, what what do you think about AARP here? Are they trying to reach out to new potential? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And they audiences here. They called in the professionals. Uh, our buddy Kai uh, over at Portal A. They're, oh, they're really? the really okay. behind this web series. Yeah. So uh, for, it's it's exciting to me to see where this goes and how it reaches a new audience. It's, it's really interesting. And, you know, one thing that I found, too, I don't know if you've looked, logged into your AdWords recently, but um, in AdWords, they are now uh, automatically creating remarketing lists based on people that watch your videos. So there's potential here that if you do watch one of these George Dakai videos, they can hit you with other uh, messages. Adult diapers come in my way. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, they've also been very active, and I think where this might be going is they've been very active um, – on Social Security and Medicare issues. And although young people are not thinking about these things necessarily right off the bat, I could see perhaps them using that remarketing list to uh, building that out. The viewership isn't too big yet, but I think with George Takai's audience, once he really starts pushing it on his social media channels, he'll, uh, he'll have something there. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, this next one, uh, Live Nation has launched a web series called The Rider Challenge with Ford. This is one that uh, Jason found. So Jason, what's up with this story here? Well, to put it, you on the spot. <laughs> well, no, it's just it's it very interesting that uh, Ford has really stepped into new media and really trying to brand and try and brand and try and reach their product out to a very wide audience and an audience that is very savvy with new media. It sure is. And they've been, you know, they were at New Media Expo when uh, I met Lou and, uh, and Tim out there. Uh, they were pretty, making a very big statement about trying to do different things with marketing. And this is kind of a reality show that's going to uh, feature the Lumineers and a lot of, a lot of celebrities uh, in this thing. So I'm sure that will uh, succeed quite nicely there. Um, this next one is, I'm going to throw this one out to Tim. What does the Fox say? It's been 40 million viewers. Is that right, Tim? Yeah. And, um, it, it, it made its way onto Ellen. So Ellen oh, is now okay. uh, is all into. Nee, 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 nee. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't seen it yet, watch it. It's addictive. Uh, uh, this uh, Norwegian uh, comedy troupe does a, a video that, that kind of makes fun of pop culture and pop videos, and it starts out with a uh, like a uh, animal furry party uh, <laughs> where they're all dressed as different animals. I, I didn't see any uh, little Ewoks there, Lou, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, they, uh, they, they, they start out that way and, you know, the cow goes moo and the fish goes blub blub, but what does the fox say? And, uh, it's a very addictive song. It's a fun little video and, and getting a lot of views. It, it really blew up about, I'd say three weeks ago. Um, but, uh, once you make it on Ellen, um, you know, you're, you're part of pop culture at that point. Right. You're, you're on the way. It moves pretty quickly. And look, you've I, been doing... 
Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Can I step in with this? Uh, I think a very important uh, point of this story is for sponsors or for companies that want to do viral, viral videos is to not project 50 million viewers right away. Work on what you want, what your message wants to be. Make it fun, and if it goes viral, it goes viral. And that's very true. If it, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I'll tell you what, I found, you know, not going viral, but getting a lot of view, uh, you know, moderate number of views on a lot of stuff can also uh, be equally valuable to you in your efforts as well. So, you know, don't always focus on uh, top of the ticket there. But I, hey, Lou, I was noticing you, you've started a whole new uh, YouTube strategy where you're doing these minute long uh, little tips and things around, around uh, Disney World. I saw one where you can start finding some of the Easter eggs and some of their uh, you know, some of their buildings and stuff. So how's that been going for you so far? And what led, what led to that decision? Yeah, so I, I knew obviously a long time ago that, you know, you, you need to be everywhere, right? You can't just do one thing. And, and I was doing the, the, the podcast and the blog, and, and I wanted to start doing more and more video. So I was releasing videos every so often as I could. But the problem with them was that I was trying to cover too much, I thought. I was trying to give you the whole bag of jelly beans at one time. And I think people clearly like small easy to consume, list-based kind of things where they get a good nugget of information and then can move on. Our attention span is clearly, you know, very small. So I came up with the idea of doing Disney in a minute. And the, the, the concept was a minute, give or take, long video about anything from the top five snacks in the Magic Kingdom to, um, you know, top three ways to save money to, um, you know, a quick little hidden treasure about the Indiana Jones epic stunt spectacular, whatever it is, and really gives people a chance to sort of tour the parks, get something in a quick and easy way, and obviously, you know, I want to make it easy to consume on the mobile devices as well, too, with a, with a quick download. And, and that's a really, uh, I think, especially now with so many mobile devices out there, that while you're at the park, if you could find a a quick hit video, or, or and I'm sure some related text about about something to do where where they're at, then they can do that. Have you looked at any like location-based uh, videos that you could do based on where they're standing in the park? Uh, I haven't, but now you've just given me something else to think about and, and research. So <laughs> I was like, wow, that's an awesome idea. There you go. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll follow up next week on that one. So moving on to uh, movies, kind of a disappointing uh, uh, box office weekend if you were uh, shooting for the, uh, the Battle of the Year, which was the number five movie. This is a movie about breakdancing, which probably would have done better in the 80s than today, but um, $4.6 million on its open. And I guess uh, according to Deadline.com, that was pretty lackluster. Uh, number four is Instructions Not Included. This is a Spanish language film. Um, it's only in 978 theaters, but it beat Battle of the Year, which was significantly greater funded. Uh, and it's uh, coming in at $34.2 million for the week. Uh, the Family is uh, slipped to number three, $5.7 million for the weekend, $34 million overall. Uh, Insidious, we talked about that last week. That's at $14.2 million, $50 million cum. And Prisoners uh, opened up at uh, $21.4 million. So uh, they're still bringing in some millions there, but the MPAA, according to the rap, is not happy with, uh, with us uh, internet people. And in fact, they're saying Google is not doing enough to thwart piracy. So uh, Tim, are, are, what do you feel about this whole uh, thing about the MPAA continually. Um, well, they're, yeah, they're really saying that, that Google is responsible for piracy by leading people to the piracy websites, and Google is saying, no, they're, they're not um, um, you know, leading people there, and that they have an algorithm in place uh, to, to keep people uh, from not finding these pirate sites, but if you look at the research, if you look at, at what people are doing, is they want to find the show that they want to watch. And if it was available on Netflix, if it was available on HBO Go, if it was available someplace legal that people could get it, then they'd get their money and the pirate sites wouldn't show up. So I think the lesson to the studios is make the stuff available and make it searchable and have an easy way for people to pay for it, and they will. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, nothing more to say than that, because I think that is exactly the problem right now. And you know, even look at something like Redbox, which is very reasonably priced. You know, it takes a month or more to get the movies to the Redbox out of these, all these stupid agreements that they do. And if they just gave people what they want, sell them what they want, not even give it to them, they, would, they will do gladly uh, fork their money over. So um, there's another story here that Jason found, um, and I'll let Jason kick this one off. The CBS uh, and Amazon, they, they teamed up with Under the Dome, which I've heard mixed uh, reviews about, but basically it's a Stephen King adaptation uh, on CBS of a dome that uh, 
falls on top of the town and they can't get out. Uh, I guess it's been running on Amazon Prime in addition to running on CBS. And there was other shows that have done this. I know that Heroes did it with uh, Netflix and ABC a while back. So, Jason, what's, uh, what's up with this? Why is there so much controversy over well, this thing? Basically, it's, it, what, what is being said is that it's really not allowing the show to be seen by people who don't have the Amazon subscription. Okay. So that's, that's the and big... Uh... That's basically the big hoopla, is that uh, it's, very, it's in a very tight media, and uh, people who don't have access to Amazon don't see the show after it's aired. Oh, I see. Right. So, so you can't see it on CBS's website. You have to have an Amazon account to go and, and, and watch it. Just get exactly. Amazon Prime. You get free shipping. It's, yeah. it's a bargain. It's awesome. <laughs> It is a bargain. It is awesome. I use it all the time. In fact, I, I had them ship me like um, for my wife's birthday. See, my wife is a black belt, and and she wanted a punching bag, and they shipped it like overnight for free. <laughs> it's this huge thing, so and it weighs a ton. You got to put water in it too, but uh, it uh, it was pretty funny. So uh, so that is that. So we've had uh, uh, Lou. Thanks for 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 joining us today. We do have some uh, apps and tips of the week, though. I'm going to start. I'm going to kick mine off here. I've got this thing. So. Um, you know, in addition to the MPAA really ticking us all off, um, Comcast can occasionally be the ire of our existence. Um, and uh, I got this thing here. It's called the HD Home Run. And what this does is gets around Comcast's, um, they have these, uh, these encryption algorithms they apply now to their stuff. So up until, I don't know how it is where you guys are, but up until last week, I could just turn my TV on and pull down HD stuff uh, as part of my cable plan just through my television. I didn't have to have a box or any of this other junk. And then one morning I woke up and my wife was telling me where TVs don't work. And sure enough, they scrambled every channel, including the ones that I was getting as part of my uh, package. And I have to, I call it Comcast, I have to go get a box, right, for, you know, seven bucks and then the HD access fee. And I've got three televisions in the house. I'm looking at 20 or $30 more a month. And I said, no way. So, I looked in, in, into seeing like, what are the alternatives out there. And uh, this thing is called the HD Home Run. It's $150. Uh, you put in this cable card, which Comcast will give you if you have a plan that includes a uh, low definition converter box. You put it in there, you plug it into your ethernet. And what it does is it essentially puts your cable onto your local network. And if you have like an older, you know, an older but functional uh, n notebook or PC laying around, you can install Windows Media uh, in there and you can then network it to your Xboxes. So not only do you get live television, you get like a full-blown uh, HD DVR network in your house well, for no that, extra That money. sounds so easy to do. My grandmother <laughs> would love that. <laughs> yeah, and this is the problem is that, and, and, I'm, and let, me just, let me just put it this way. It ended, the, the weekend has ended with me drilling holes through the floor and running wires because <laughs> the wireless wasn't supporting this thing well enough. So this is not easy, but if you want to stick it to the man, that's how you do it. And, and here's the kicker. Comcast will give you two dollars and fifty cents a month for doing this yourself. So, what what more could there be to do you know to this than that? So, uh, so I'm still in the process I, of working. I see it why out, your but... wife has a punching bag now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm I'm really and sh and this is still not working. I had I've, I've gone to the hardware store three times. I, my, my 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 floor has like more like layers to it than I thought, and I'm in, I'm in deep trouble. So I have to finish this project up this afternoon. But, uh, but once it's working, it's going to be great. The only problem is that it takes your TV about, you know, about an extra five minutes to boot because you have to load the <laughs> Xbox up. And you gotta, so, yeah, there's no easy way to thwart the man, but there's, there's, there's a process by which you can make it work. I will add, though, that some channels you can view on your computer with this thing, and it's a lot easier, um, but it's still not good enough for my wife, so I'm going to keep working on this thing. So, now Jason, um, from the home of the BlackBerry, Canada, and Toronto, no less, which is where they come from, uh, horrible week for BlackBerry. They've had this uh, big announcement that they are getting out of the consumer market completely. I just reviewed the Q10. I thought it was a great phone um, for, you know, for what it is. And unfortunately, it's uh, you know, too little too late. But they were going to launch an app uh, called BB Messenger, which would allow all these BlackBerry Messenger people, those that are still left on it, to use uh, the BlackBerry system on their iPhone and on their Android phone. And something bad happened, Jason. What was that? Well, I mean, I think it is a smart move for them, be it a little late. But it's to, I mean, it was, it's set to design to, to keep people on BlackBerry so they can communicate with people that have Android or iPhones. Um, but basically what happened is they were supposed to launch it yesterday, and there were so many fake uh, 
BlackBerry Messenger apps, and there was the real one that got leaked online ahead of, ahead of schedule, which broke the Android app and forced uh, BlackBerry to cancel their launch, and they're going to launch it at some point in the near future. So, so the, actual, the actual version of this thing got clobbered by the fakes? Yes. We so overloaded the their fakes servers? And, the fakes and the, the, somehow the, the leaked one uh, broke the official app. Wow. Well, that is brutal for BlackBerry. They don't need that this week. So, so that's unfortunate, but you know, I still, I'm getting my iPhone 5S. I didn't get it yet. I, I, I refuse to stand online. I don't know about anyone else on this call, but I, I, I avoided the iPhone line. I did that once by accident, and I will never do it <laughs> again. Uh, yeah, well, here's, here's the thing with this. Uh, now, this you is had another... to drill a hole in your base. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Wires and and I drilled right through the iPhone. And I, I did this thing a couple years ago when the 4 came out. I pre-ordered the phone, and, and there was an option for in-store pickup. I said, oh, I'll be driving by the Apple store that morning. I'll just go and pick it up. And, you know, there was a, there was a three and a half hour wait even if you had one you paid for sitting in the store, um, you had to sit on, on this horrible line. It was, it was, it was uh, you know, the news came by, I kind of hid my face because I just didn't want to be seen with that. So I said, never again. So I'm going to wait a couple extra days. But you know what I found, and I'm sure, Lou, you've seen this too, that the obscure stuff that you review about your topic gets more traffic than the things that everybody's going to be looking at, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, still to this day, one of the, uh, the shows that is downloaded and commented on the most is the top 10 smells of Walt Disney World. And I could talk about the opening of the new attractions all day long, but people are like, oh, it smells like the musty water and pirates. That's the thing that... Uh, That's the thing that gets everybody yeah. going. Yeah, I, I, I like the... Yeah, there's a couple of definite <laughs> smells there. there was, then you got the turkey legs that people walk around with. So, uh, so, so Lou, where can, uh, where can people find you and all, that, all the things that you're doing? All the, uh, the Disney-related stuff that I do is at wdwradio.com, and then my personal website is lumongello.com. And I'm going to be checking that out in a few years. I've got a four-and-a-half-month-old daughter, but as soon as she's old enough, I'm going to be taking her to Disney World, so I'm going to start uh, brushing up on all the Disney stuff uh, very soon there. So thanks for joining us, Lou, and thanks for bringing all your friends with you, too. It was a good, uh, good turnout today. Uh, thanks Jason, so much for having where, me. Yeah, no problem. Jason, where can people find you? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Jason Perry, J-A-S-O-N-P-E-R-R-I-E-R. -E and you can go to him with all your WordPress needs, and uh, he's been excellent for us because uh, he, he's out there all week finding stuff for Tim and I to talk about on Sundays. So um, thank you and very much for all the work you're doing. And you can finally put the face and voice to the name that we announce at the end of every show. So, And Tim, where can people find you? Well, you can find me at one Tim Street, either on Twitter or .com. And uh, there's a rumor. There's a rumor. It's, it's not official yet, but uh, you might be able to find me at Walt Disney World uh, during the first week of October, uh, directing something. I can't tell you what it is yeah. yet, but uh, wow. maybe in Orlando, Lou. All right. If, if there's a rumor we may have to get together for a meal then. There you go. <laughs> That's great. That's cool. So, well, enjoy that. It's a good time to go visit Florida. And you can find me at lonseidman.com, L-O-N-S-E-I-D-M-A-N. Uh, that same spelling will also get you me on Twitter. And I do gadget reviews, which is why I've got all this retro stuff behind me. So uh, if you have, uh, you know, I, I just, whatever pops into my front door, I just review it down here in my basement lair. So uh, check me out I, I there. I want to see you review that punching bag. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do that, um, you know, because uh, I was sick of being the punching bag. So um, we, we've got a replacement now. So when we get it set up, we will uh, have her beat the crap out of it. And I, I think that'll do pretty well, actually. So uh, it'll get my too. wife into karate. Uh, karate instruction. She does Kempo, which is a very oh. aggressive thing. She is, uh, she is very, and it's funny, you would look at her and think, oh, she's, you know, she could never hurt a fly, but she, she, can, she is a killer. Um, she hasn't killed anyone yet, but um, <laughs> anyone who ever crosses her, it's going to be bad. Uh, you can also find our show, BehindTheVideo.com, and that links to our Google Plus community. We're all about the Google Plus, as are our viewers today, so you can find us there. Uh, if you join the community, every week we'll send you a reminder of when this show will air, so you can check us out. We're also on Stitcher Radio, on iTunes, and any, anywhere you can find Lou, you could probably find us. So uh, add us to your podcast queue, and uh, we hope to uh, get, uh, get some more listeners of our show there. So this will do it for this edition of Behind the Video. We are a wrap. Stories for this episode were compiled by producer Jason Perrier. Follow him on Twitter at J-A-S-O-N-P-E-R-R-I-E-R. Behind the Video is a production of Ape Digital Incorporated and the Independent Media Network, LLC. All rights reserved.